All right, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 13. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13, Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, breadth the length, and the depth, and the height, how to know the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church, <clears throat> by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you tonight for your goodness and watch care to this little church. Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us as we try to share the gospel in this place. God, help us on Saturday, Lord, that uh, you would cross our path with people that need to hear the gospel. Lord, with people that have heard a fake gospel and an untrue gospel that we might share with them the words of life. We pray that tonight. Uh, God, help us to be held together in the days in which we live, uh, that we might be a tie of fellowship and be an honor unto you. God, now bless your word according to your mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Uh, now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. I've heard part of it taken out of context. Uh, but remember that Paul is writing to believers. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus knew some things about hard knocks and some difficult times. Now, we live in a day and age where we think we've seen that, but we really haven't. Now, to encourage them in what, what they were doing, he basically said this, don't think about what's going on, think about God. Think about how big, how tall, how strong the God that we serve is. And if we can, you know what, if we really get to thinking about that, we can't wrap our minds around how big God is. Right. Now, in most churches today, they'll teach you a God that's trying to accomplish something and hoping that you'll do something with him. You know what, that's a God that's about this big. Just waiting on your, your decision. But you know, the God of the Bible, if he can move mountains and he can open the sea, he can do any, abundantly more than we could ask or think. That's the God of the Bible. Amen. So big that we can't get our minds and our hearts around it. That's the God that we serve even today. So going back to verse 13, Paul says, wherefore, and apparently they had expressed discouragement over Paul's trials. Now, you know what? When somebody's under trials, certainly we, uh, we should express our concern and pray for them, but don't get the hummy drugs. Uh, now, uh, I don't know uh, what situation, I knew a man uh, several years ago that was arrested and spent six weeks in, in jail at the Louisville jail over in Kentucky because he wouldn't take a license to preach. You know what? I stand by the man. I, would, I don't need a license to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I stood with the man, and I know that he was hurting, but you know what? Instead of discouraging me, it made me excited. It made me glad. And that's how Paul was saying to me, listen, this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. 
It, it, it's a good thing that I am suffering these things for the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't get discouraged on, on, on the situation that is at hand. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He was giving them an example. He was giving them some teaching. This is your glory. This is your light shed because you know what? It's coming your way too. And this way you'll know how to deal with it. Verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That you, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. So every day the Bible says, you know, he was bowing down and praying for the church at Ephesus and praying for the church at Corinth and praying for the church at Thessalonica that rather than to be discouraged and ready to quit at the trials of Paul, that they'd be ready for theirs. Have you ever thought when, when people watch you as a believer and your reaction to something, what are they seeing? Are they being encouraged by that reaction? Or are they being discouraged uh, by what they see? And when, when we get the hummy drums and we say, oh my, and we begin to weep a little bit. Listen, what we should be is excited to suffer that for our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, I'm getting you ready in mind, and I'm getting you ready in prayer because trouble is on its way. Difficulty is coming for you. That he would grant you, verse 16, according to his riches, to, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with, with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now we see that capital S spirit there, the Holy Ghost, the spirit, uh, that's how you get strengthened. You know, have you ever been in a preaching service, and, and boy, I have, I, I've seen some good ones down through the years, and, and you get, just get strengthened by what's said, the Holy Spirit will come down, and he'll beam upon you, and he'll use what that man has to say, and you've got enough to go a few more days. That's what he does. You know, very often when I get when I get like that, and, and you know, I get down and out too, I think about back at that meeting down at Bone Smells Church when that old uh, that uh, FBI agent got saved. Do y'all remember about that? And, and when I'm about ready to quit, listen, you know what? God still comes down. That was a good meeting. That was a meeting that I'll remember the entirety of my life. And so we see then as the Lord's people that um, what we need is a more frequent dose of spending time with the Holy Spirit. You know what? What I you know that that is our medicine. You know, in, in nursing and in medicine, if if we start a new medicine and it's helping, but it's not quite there, you know what we do? We increase the dose. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Sometimes what we just need to do is increase our dose, and then we wouldn't be ready to quit so much. But uh, we wouldn't be so discouraged. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that this is where we need to be. Because see, the difficulty that Paul spoke of, if you read the part of the uh, in Revelations in those first three chapters, Ephesus did have a problem. And and you know what? I believe they were ready to deal with it because maybe they did some of these things that Paul had reminded them of. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, the difficulty today, and it's a wonderful, wonderful teaching of the Word of God, uh, grace, 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 but what about faith, faith, faith? See, I'm really scared today there's not enough trust in God's people to fill a popcorn sack. Do you believe him or not? Uh, and, and there's some difficulties there in every one of us, but I, I truly believe what Paul's telling them is you need some faith because difficult times are coming. 
uh, hardships is on the way, get a hold of and spend more time with the Holy Spirit that your faith may be increased and you'll be ready when the time comes. Uh, verse of, the rest of verse 17, that ye, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, where do you see love at? I think it's the Galatians letter and uh, it's the first fruit after salvation. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Ever thought, you know, and I, I know how I present sometimes, and I have to be cautious. And we need to present with love. And sometimes uh, I think I've got a little too much of my daddy in me, and I don't always present like I should. We need, uh, you know, we shouldn't be glad ever uh, that people are going off in eternity's hell. No, no, no. That should kill us. That 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 should that should break our hearts. Because you know what? We don't even understand what eternity is, and it's coming. And and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, what we need to really dwell on, and what we need to get into is doing this thing of showing love. Verse 18, uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth or width, the length, and the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ. Now, that was, that was his hope for the church at Ephesus, that they just get a little bit of knowledge of what that was. You know what? You, you get some of that when the Lord saves you. Because you really, really, you realize how vile and ungodly you are, and then He still chooses to save you out of His goodness and grace. Amen. And uh, then as time goes on, what that love should do is increase. But here comes the old devil, the serpent, Satan himself, and, and he, man, he'll steal that love away from you. He don't want you. He don't want you showing the love of Christ to anyone. That's right. if, if he can make you present like a sour lemon, boy, he's going to do it. And you know what? Shame on us when he allows us to do that. When we present like we could care less if uh, people lived or died, shame on us. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that what Paul was saying in these hard times, in these difficult situations, and they are coming, remember how big our God is. He is infinite. He is everywhere. He's here, there, and yonder. He's from the top of this universe to the bottom of the same. He's from the core of the earth to the outside. He is everything. And then we get upset when the light bills do. Mm. Mm. Bible says he is uh, the he he's a sh uh, he owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He can take care of it. Yeah. He, he he's able. Uh, but you know, uh, sometimes we need a good lesson in, in just faith, don't we? Uh, we we need to remember what our God. You know what? Not just remember, but we need to be reminded of how big our God is. Now go with me, if you will, back to the book of Job. And we're just going to notice a few men that re remained faithful, remembering who their God was, even when times got rough. Uh, Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, for time's sake. And Job chapter 1 and verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and, I, and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that Satan himself is accountable to God. 
And, and he said, where have you been? And you know what? Satan had to tell him. He, he had to give duty. He had, he had to let him know exactly what he'd been up to. And, and so the next time you have some ungodly false prophet trying to tell you that, that God is fighting Satan, listen, he's already won. Satan is under his foot. And so he always is accountable. Satan is not more powerful than God. He wanted that, and he never had it. And so we find that as the Lord's people, certainly uh, that ought to be an encouragement to us when the next thing that, that comes at us. <laughs> And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he had on every side? Has thou blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land? Put forth, but put forth thine hand now, and touch him, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice two uh, two things there. First of all. Satan knew there was a boundary around, around Job. Yeah. And the, the reason I think that he knew that, he'd been looking at him. Right. He'd, been, he'd been evaluating him. And, and, and again, you see the dominion of the Almighty, he knew he couldn't get through there. Isn't it a wonderful thing to think about? If God wants it, and you know what? And, and th there's been some times I know of a certainty that he had a hedge around me and de the devil was over there and there wasn't one thing he could do to reach me. But you know, there's been some other times he's left the hedge down just like, like he did on Job. And he says, yeah. you can take his youngins, you can take his money, but you leave his life untouched. And then, you know, th this is one thing sometimes we get discouraged. He, he didn't tell Job any way in which he had to accomplish it. So we have to trust that all those evils, when the house fell down, and, and, and when the Midianites came and killed all the cattle, and all that went on, you know what? That had to be Satan's devices, is what it's called in the New Testament. And he, he had the means to use them. He did it by his own method. And you know what? He did it. This is the thing about the attacks of Satan, and you remember this if you don't remember anything. He did it in some way. In other words, that would have been the most devastating thing to the devil. But it wasn't the most devastating thing to Job. Mm. So he understands like, a, like an ungodly lost person. And he thinks all there is is money. He thinks all there is is the things that you possess. And he attacks you on those terms. He attacks you along those lines because that's all the understanding that he ever had is wanting power and wanting money and wanting things. So he attacks mankind in the very same way. And, 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 and dear friend, I have to say, most of the time, it works. Now, drop it down with me to verse 20. Verse 20, Job chapter uh, 1 uh, uh, Job chapter 1 verse 20 Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked I shall I return the Lord gave the Lord had taken away blessed be the name of the Lord see at the end of it, Job worshipped God. 
And the devil could not comprehend how it fell out. And you know why? Because he doesn't understand the nature of God. And he certainly doesn't understand the nature of saved folks. Now go with me. Uh, chapter 2 now, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, And again there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Now, I don't know much about the military. I learned a little bit more working there at the Veterans Nursing Home. But I did know this, that, that, that soldiers are called to inspection by the man that's above. And he comes in and he sees that their uh, uniforms are straight and how their, how their bed is made up and all that stuff. And I really believe that in the spirit world, they're accountable to what they do. <coughs> They report for duty. And so when everybody else came up, he came up too. And you know what? He was accountable as well. And, uh, and, and he's still in that condition today. Uh, the world don't want you to think that way. And the devil don't want you to think today that way. But he's still accountable unto the Almighty. And if he calls him up, you know what? He has to present front and center. And he still has to give an account. I think that's very interesting. And the height of his evilness, he's still accountable to God and always will be. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Is thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, both uh, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he, ho he holdeth fast his integrity, meaning he's still serving God. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered and said, and, and, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but Put forth thine hand now, and touch his bones, and his his bone, and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, another thing, that's the other thing, the only other thing that he kind of understands is flesh. Now, as best I understand from the word of God, angels don't have flesh. Like holy angels, they can take on an appearance of flesh. But he thinks he's got it figured out. And you know what? When it comes to the flesh without salvation, he does. He's got her figured out. And the reason why most people will protect this thing over everything else. And it's just in man to do so. And we finally, instead, you know the rest of the story, boils came up on him and he had to be scraped with the pots hurt. He didn't have any way to, to medicate himself because he done lost his fortune. Didn't come and see a doctor or any of that. And still, he served God. So we find then that that's how big God is. He, he controls every little thing that happens to us when we're sick, he controls it. When we're well, he controls it. When we're young, he controls it. And when we're dying, he still controls it. That is just showing when we get stressed out about finances, church, he's got it. Now, with that said, I want you to see financially, old Job hit rock bottom. He don't, he don't guarantee you... Uh, uh, Three hots and a cot. That's right. We think you should, but that's not what the Bible teaches. And, and so we find then, as as the Lord's people, what what we need to understand is He's got this handle no matter what. First Kings. First Kings seventeen. 1 Kings 17, a man that surely understand, understood the nature of God, served him without question, 
that shows the amount of faith and trust that he, did, he had. And because I, I believe he understood just to a little bit how big God was. And because he understood it, he was willing to step out on faith no matter what he was told. So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17 in the first verse, the Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according at my word, according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. In other words, it fed into Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of God. Now, a lot of people get into the faith that Elijah had, and it certainly was there. But you know what brought the birds was our God. You, you know what kept the brook going as long as God wanted it going? Was God. And you know when Cherith grew up, you know why it dried up? Because of God. People don't like to say that, but certainly it was. I'll tell you this, the devil didn't draw it up or dry her up, or I think we would know about it, don't sure. you? And, and so what's good now, what's smooth sailing now, might not be tomorrow. And, and so we find then what I believe moved Elijah to this situation was he remembered how big and tall and wide and strong he's, his God was, and so he went. Now, I'll give you this idea, and I really don't know the answer myself. Y'all can help me with it. How did they come? He said, I've commanded them to bring you uh, meat and bread. Twice a day, they were going to come. Where did they get it? Mm -hmm. What kind of meat was it? Did, did, did Elijah fix it up? Did he fry her up? Bible really doesn't say, does it? Mm -hmm. Did he bring it to them just like, just like it comes out of the wind at McDonald's ready to eat? I think it's possible, don't you? Yeah. And, and, and so we find then that in this dry, horrible time, he was eating when nobody else was. He was drinking whenever all the rest of the wells were dry. And you know what? When it dried up, God had another plan. Now, that becomes your measure of faith. When God's plan changes, you know what? He's not necessarily going to say, okay, I'm going to provide for you this way, this way, and this way. He might not tell you nothing at all, but just to do it. Just to do it. And really, it's not that where faith begins anyway. And so we find, we find that he very much trusted the Lord and stepped on, out on faith. And then in verse... Eight, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a wo uh, the widow woman was there, according, uh, excuse me, was there gathering of sticks, and he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in, the, in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first. And bring it to bring it unto me, and after that make for thee and thy son. 
Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, he said, I've, I've prepared a widow woman down there to, to take care of you. But did she know it? No. See, you're going to be called on to do some things that you don't even know that's part of God's plan. Right. And you know what? The very best advice I can give you is just have faith. You know what? You know what it took for that woman to go in there and prepare for him first? It took faith. You know what? Maybe she remembered how big and great and exceedingly above all that we could ask or think that was who her God was. Because she had a plan. She was going to make two little cakes. They was going to eat them up and, and then eventually starve to death. And see, God had another plan, but the means seemed crazy. Right. The means that accomplished what his plan was, was feed another man first. And you know, this is the marvel, and I believe Elijah was no, known about. Uh, you could look at it like this. He was going to use the very one that caused the thing to start with. Because he said, <laughs> he went in and says, ain't no rain except by my word. And you know what? That wouldn't have made him uh, most likely to succeed, would it? So she knew who he was, and despite all that, she was used of God because she remembered how big her God was, and she wasn't fearful. Uh, one more place in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, In verse 23, very familiar verses of Scripture, uh, the, uh, we find Lydia saved in the earlier part of this chapter. And now we're further down, Acts chapter 15 and verse 23. No, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong book. 16, verse 23. The Bible says this, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, meaning Paul and Silas, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust, him in, thrust them into the inner prison and made their fa feet fast in stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. So what, what do you think uh, inspired them to be at midnight to start singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I trust your mighty power. How great and wonderful and exceeding above all things is your, mo is your <laughs> wet breath, width, and height. Do you reckon what caused them that? I believe it's because they began to think, you know what? <laughs> He's provided for me before. You know what? I, I've been in worse circumstances than this. And when old Paul was let off to Rome in shackles, you know what? I believe he remembered, well, when I was in jail before, you know what? God took care of it. Mm -hmm. See, he's building our faith for something, but don't forget how big and immense and glorious and wonderful our God is. So we see that... Uh, Despite their circumstance, they still had faith enough to praise God. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice and said, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. And I've preached many times for that to be true. I think every prisoner in that building was, was saved that night. Because see, the natural man would have run like a dog. But every one of them was still there despite their bands being gone. See, you know, uh, you know what's wrong with our prison uh, government system today uh, prisons don't change them does it God does you hear about this rehabilitation you know that will never work it never has and it never will 
because it doesn't change the soul. It doesn't change the inner man, and you're still just as depraved. You can teach them how to be a boiler maker. You can teach them to weld, and when they get out, you know, you know what you have? You have an evil boiler maker and an evil welder. That, that's the only difference. And so we find then that this, in, in a difference to that scenario, we find here that they are totally changed by what's happened, and they're sitting there waiting for the guard, never moved a muscle to leave that place. Then he, meaning the jailer, called for a light and sprang in and, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and sirs what and, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And old Paul said, Believe in thine heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. See, he didn't throw in baptism, although they were, went and were baptized. He said he didn't say, Let me dunk you and all will be well. He said he simply said, You believe on me. You know what belief in the Lord Jesus Christ to be sufficient for your sin is? It's faith. Plain and simple. It's just faith. You know uh, you know why people think we're crazy coming into this building on a rainy Wednesday night? They don't have faith. No. They do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They've never been born again. And uh, when you think about that, uh, you really begin to understand how precious salvation really is. Now, the next time you're in a bad situation, whether it's money, medical, dreary, dreariness, whatever it may be, you remember how big our God is. There's nothing outside His doing, there's nothing outside His ability. He's steadfast, he's strong, and, and just give it to him. Now, when you get tragic news, if you've not prepared yourself along the way with the little things, it'll overcome you. But now, if you've seen how good God already is, then you'll be ready. You'll be prepared. All the rest of this week, I want you to think about how high, how mighty, how wide and deep our God really is. And uh, I believe we'll come to the house of God as a different people.